Imagine that after a vacation, you're flying home in a plane at an altitude of 10,000 meters. Very soon, you'll be home and meeting your family. Suddenly, the fuselage is struck by lightning. From the impact, the aircraft practically breaks apart in midair. Passengers strapped to their seats are flying towards Earth you realize that you are doomed. In 1971, this is exactly what happened. 17-year-old Juliana Kepke was flying with her mother and 91 other passengers over Peru. The tragedy occurred at an altitude of 3 kilometers. 10 seconds after the crash, the young Juliana reached terminal velocity, about 200 kilometers per hour. It seemed that her fate was inevitable. But she managed to survive. The girl broke her collarbone and suffered a concussion, but survived. She was saved by trees whose branches slowed her fall. Does this mean that from the height of a bird in flight, you can survive a fall without a parachute? Juliana isn't the only person who survived a fall from a great height. Traveler and TV host Bear Grylls, at the beginning of his career, fell from a height of 5,000 meters. During a landing in Zambia, his parachute failed to open. He broke three vertebrae and miraculously survived. Fifteen years later, Bear decided to repeat the trick. Right there during his fall, he cut the main parachute slings and released his spare one, after which he successfully landed. Bear's trick is certainly risky, but there are people in the world who are much crazier. On July 30, 2016, American stuntman Luke Akins deliberately jumped out of an airplane at an altitude of 7,600 meters without a parachute on his back. If you think he decided to take his own life, wait for the conclusion. Luke prepared for a year and a half and used modern equipment to survive from the height of the Himalayan mountains. How did he manage to land without crashing? For this purpose, an entire parachute complex was built, in the center of which was a huge grid of supermolecular polyethylene measuring 30 by 30 meters. It was the height of 20 floors, so that the stuntman didn't hit the ground. Luke's task was to fly almost 8 kilometers, not deviate from the set course in flight, and land on his back in the very center of the grid, measuring 8 by 8 meters. If you decide to pull off such a trick without preparation, you'll most likely miss the target. To correct the fall, special lamps were installed on the Earth, which indicate the landing place, and a GPS sensor was built into Luke's helmet, which signaled at the slightest deviation. In addition, three other people jumped down with the stuntman. Don't worry, they had parachutes. One of them was videotaping what was happening. The second flew with a smoke bomb so that it could be seen from the ground. A third took the oxygen tank from Aikens when it was no longer needed. After all, at this altitude, the air is thin and you can simply suffocate. At an altitude of one and a half kilometers, the team opened their parachutes and Luke continued to fall alone. The landing was successful. Do you think you could repeat this jump? Luke Akins has jumped from the sky 18,000 times. If you jumped once every day, it would take you 49 years to break Luke's record. The stuntman had prepared his body for this extreme stunt. So stay on the ground so you don't say goodbye to life too early. 7,600 meters isn't the limit. In the year 2012, the Austrian skydiver Felix Baumgartner jumped to Earth from the stratosphere. With his jump at that time, he set four world records at once. The parachute jump with the highest altitude, the highest manned flight, the longest free fall distance, and most interestingly, the fastest speed in free fall. During the flight, Felix broke the sound barrier. He was falling at a speed of 1,357 kilometers per hour. This speed is developed by supersonic aircraft that fly at low altitudes. 
Especially for the skydiver, engineers developed a spacesuit that had a built-in oxygen supply and was protected from overload. The fall to Earth lasted 10 minutes. Actually, I did not know when I was passing the sound barrier because there were no signs. You know, I've been told there's going to be a, a shock wave going through my suit. I never saw that shock wave. So I did not hear the supersonic boom because it happens way behind you. So by the time I opened my parachute, I did not know did I break the speed of sound or not? But when I landed, I've been told by a lot of people that I broke the, the, the sound barrier because they heard the supersonic boom on the ground. A new record in 2014 was set by Google employee Robert Allen Eustace. He fell from a height of 42 kilometers and landed successfully. If you suddenly find yourself in the stratosphere without a spacesuit, you will most likely freeze before you crash on the surface of the Earth. At the height from which Robert jumped, it isn't so cold. The temperature is close to zero degrees Celsius. From 40 to 55 kilometers above the surface is the stratopause, a place where the temperature practically doesn't change. But it will get colder and colder with the decline. At 25 kilometers, it will be minus 56 and a half degrees Celsius. You probably won't die, but the warmest sweater won't save you from hypothermia. Even drinking hot tea in flight, you still risk getting hypothermia. It seems that a suit with heating and an oxygen supply would allow you to jump to Earth without any problems, even from the upper atmosphere. So let's go higher and set a new world record. However, there's one problem. In the upper atmosphere, other laws apply, and you simply cannot fall to the surface of the planet. For example, if you jump out of the International Space Station, which is hanging in the thermosphere at an altitude of more than 400 kilometers, you will continue to orbit the Earth. In other words, you will enter orbit and will be like a satellite circling our planet at the first cosmic speed for a long time. The Earth will still pull you towards it, but the fall may last a year or even decades. During this time, you will die from solar radiation or simply burn up because the temperature in the thermosphere can reach 1,700 degrees Celsius. But even if you're in a super suit, you won't last a month in orbit without lunch, not to mention oxygen, which there's only enough of for a few hours. So here you are, flying in orbit at a speed of nearly 8 kilometers per second. This is four times faster than the fastest bullet. To fall to the Earth, you'll need to accelerate another 4 kilometers per second towards the surface. If you're having trouble, here's a tip. Put your jetpack on top of your suit, turn the engines on full, and let's go. Your journey will be short. When you reach the lower atmosphere at the first cosmic speed, you will simply burn up due to the friction. To your family, who will be watching you from Earth, you'll look like a tiny little meteor. If the super suit saves you from overheating, then you can still fight for your life and try to fly to Earth in one piece. This flight will give you a lot of impressions. For example, in the thermosphere, the sky won't be blue, but black like in space. In this layer, you can see the aurora with your own eyes. In the mesosphere, meteors will burn up nearby you, space pebbles that accidentally fell under the influence of Earth's gravity. Just below, you will be able to fly through a pearlescent cloud, shimmering with all the colors of the rainbow. In the stratosphere, you'll meet a weather balloon that collects weather data. And now you see the usual rain clouds. So the troposphere begins. You're on your way to Earth. Only 10 or 15 kilometers left to fly. You're three to four minutes away from hitting the surface. The air gradually becomes breathable. The temperature rises with every kilometer. At an altitude of approximately 4,000 meters, you'll finally be able to remove your spacesuit and fly safely to Earth. Suddenly, you break out in a cold sweat. When you take off your spacesuit, you realize that you forgot your parachute on the ISS. Will you be able to survive the landing? If you're watching this video while you're falling from the height of El Bruce, do this. To begin, turn your chest to the earth, spread your arms and legs wide, and put your head back. This way, you will increase your air resistance and slow down your fall. 
Now, evaluate the area. If there's a forest, swamp, or snow nearby, aim there. Tree branches, a viscous bog, or a snowdrift could save your life. If you're unlucky enough to fall in the middle of the ocean, nothing will save you. Landing on water is no different from landing on asphalt. You'll simply be smeared because of the surface tension. Just before you make contact with the ground, curl up into a ball. Press your knees to your chest, lower your head, and cover it with your hands. Try not to fall head first. Aim directly at the center of the snowdrift. Are you still alive? Perfect. I hope this video helped you survive. Now you can repeat what English pilot Nicholas Alchemade did during the Second World War. In 1944, he fell out of a plane without a parachute from a height of five and a half kilometers. Nicholas fell into a snowdrift and survived, then got up dusted himself off and lit a cigarette. Remember, smoking is harmful. And as usual, thank you for watching.